And what's going on, everybody? Welcome on into the Check Your Brain podcast. Uh, as I always say, wherever you are listening or watching this, podcast can be video podcast too. And I put them on YouTube and all the other you, uh, video platforms as well. On top of that, I also have a Patreon at patreon.com slash Tony Mazer for three bucks a month. You get extra content. Why would you want that? Why would you want to spend your hard-earned money? Well, I also put my <laughs> my a lot of time, a lot of effort into it. So uh, go check it out if you want. If you're not, that's fine. I still put out free podcasts every Wednesday on the major podcast platforms, which includes this one. Hi, everybody. Again, that is me. That was my logo. And my name is Tony Mazer. I appreciate you folks for uh, checking out the show today. And uh, I have a very special guest, someone who I have uh, uh, had an opportunity to speak to back in my radio days. But uh, uh, the radio days don't really pay anymore. And um, yeah, it's not really work. Didn't really work out too well over time. But uh, also, ever since the last time I talked to to this gentleman, there was this thing called COVID that hit, and because of COVID, we started out with this new uh, newfangled video technology called Zoom, and Zoom would pop up, and you could actually see this person face to face, even if you weren't face to face. And some of us decided, hey, instead of scheduling meetings and doing important stuff, how about we all just do podcasts? And it was an easy your way to be face to face and actually have a little bit of a clearer uh, vision for doing some of these podcasts, literally. And that is my guest today is Steve Stolier. He's uh, again, I've spoken to him uh, years ago in my radio days, but he uh, is most famous for uh, living, really being working with and kind of being a part of the whole Groucho Marx thing uh, in the last couple of years of his life from 1974 to 77. He chronicled those things, uh, those instances in his book, which is Raised Eyebrows. It's been available for a while, but hey, why not sell a couple of extra copies here? Steve, thank you so much for doing the podcast here. Wait, I want to read about my book. Go ahead yes. and humble yourself for, uh, oh, let, wow, okay. I'd read that. That sounds good to me. And I, and honestly, I would show, because normally, like, I, I'm sharing the screen here, the raised eyebrows here, if you're watching on the YouTube uh, page. Um, uh, but I also have a copy of it. I can't find it. And I think oh. it's because I lent it to, like, six different people. And I think the sixth person didn't return it. But it's probably so dog-eared. I read it about three or four times. And it's a great read. And it really gives you a little bit of those... Um, those uh, uh, updates that I think a lot of people were wondering with the gaps in the uh, history and the legacy of Groucho Marx. Well, what was it like in the last couple of years, which is what you chronicle here in this book. So I uh, just go, go to Amazon and go, go check it out, uh, please. It, it's a great read, no matter what, even if you didn't know who Groucho Marx was, uh, you know, whether it's Marx it's brothers or anything. It's a story about a fan who only wanted to live long enough to shake hands with his hero. And instead I got a whole lot more than I bargained for. And uh, so even if you're not a Groucho fan, you can imagine if your hero was a, an old sports hero or singer or actress, whatever it is, imagine not just crossing paths, but becoming part of their household and their daily lives in their in their last years. Uh, I should probably also say that in addition to Amazon, if anyone would like a signed or personalized copy, uh, they can order it directly from me from my website, which is Steve Stolier, S-T-O-L-I-A-R dot com. And I will be happy to uh, inscribe it however you wish. There's my shameless plug that's out of the way. There it is. And I, I, I think your video dropped off here. Uh, I, don't, I don't see your your charming uh, dapper face here unless you I don't want to. <laughs> I see you. Yes. Uh, I think it's one of those uh, weird Zoom things, but it's OK. I'll 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 keep talking. We'll figure something out. But uh, in the well, meantime, you got, you got rid of the Amazon listing. Yes, I have it right here. I'll share it again. That was this You were sharing it with that and mm -hmm. then you got rid of that. But instead of bringing me into the equation. It was all you all the time. I guess so. I guess it was just e either trying to pimp the book out or my uh, my my uh, uh, millennial 35-year-old Polish face here from Cleveland, Ohio. 
Um, so, Steve, I wanted to get into, I was talking to you off the air a little bit about, uh, we'll talk a little bit more Groucho and, you know, Zeppo, Gummo, and even Flemo. We'll get to all that here in a little bit. But uh, going through your IMDb, because you were somebody that even in the days of uh, being at UCLA and being a, a young kid in the 70s, um, and then coming f uh, from all of this, and you're you're surrounded by showbiz people in and out of Groucho's house over on um, over in Beverly Hills. That it, it it you had to work in the showbiz industry of some sort, and you eventually did. You got to be a TV writer, and you did a lot of voiceover stuff for shows. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I, talk a little bit about that. How you were able to take a little bit of what you learned from working with Groucho, what you learned from studying film at UCLA to, all right, I think I've uh, written enough. I've been around enough people. Well, how can I apply these skills to now working in Hollywood in, uh, in the eighties and the nineties? Well, um, when I got the Groucho job in 74, I was uh, two years into being a history major at UCLA because I had and still have a lifelong passion for history, uh, archaeology, paleontology. And uh, I also always was drawn to the clever word plays and impressions and stuff. I was class clown in our high school class of 1100. And uh, I... I liked writing little short, funny, sketchy things, but I didn't really take seriously that I could make money in the entertainment industry. So even though I was a fanatic about old movies and old comedians, and even though I seemed to have a flair for funniness, I thought, well, but that's, you know, that's a good hobby. Um, as, if, as if being a history major was, was going to be the magic platinum road to riches beyond my wildest dreams. There, eh, for those who are also looking, there I am with my mutton chops and a full head of hair and a mustache. And uh, in, in November of 74, Groucho's backyard with my Snoopy Joe Cool shirt. I like that. And, I like everybody's shirts here. I don't know which one I like more. <laughs> and... And this, I felt like I was posing next to a prized marlin that it had taken me years to land on the boat, just reeling it in with my seatbelt on on the deck of the boat. And it, it was a great moment. And I'm so happy to have that image now all these years later. But yes, what happened was when I, when I started working for Groucho, I was, I really felt at home, especially with his group of old writer friends and uh, clever pals. And I just, it, it became this magnetic force where I just couldn't see staying a history major because I felt there was something I could do possibly, probably, hopefully as a writer for television or film or something like that. Um, I actually had the rare pleasure of meeting humorist S.J. Perelman at Groucho's house. He- Academy Award winner. Yeah, for Around the World in 80 Days. He had, uh, he worked on monkey business and horse feathers for the Marx Brothers, but in his own right, he, he was a prolific, humorist writing for the New Yorker and other magazines and his books fill like 20 volumes of his short humorous pieces and uh, I managed to corner him for a while and he actually advised me to write plays because he said that uh, television was basically the decisions are made by the producer and films it's in the hands of the director but if you're a writer, you have more control over what you've written if you write for the theater. So that was interesting advice, although I didn't follow it because I again wondered how do you how do you make money writing a play and waiting for someone to put it on and that sort of thing. Uh, so I shifted my major from history to motion picture television and graduated in 76 with a 
bachelor's degree in motion picture television, which of course entitled me to nothing. Uh, it, there was no discount at theaters. I wasn't given a job as a writer or an apprentice or even in the mail room of a studio. Um, so it was fine that I had the degree and I did feel like that was where my heart was, but uh, that was no shortcut to fame and uh, employment. Uh, I ended up getting a job in the steno pool at Universal Studios. I was actually, Groucho was still alive, so I was trading off. Since I wasn't in college anymore, I had more time and so was able to be more part-time at Groucho's. And then also at night, at, uh, let me see, the hours were 11 in the morning to 8 at night. And I sat at a Selectric 2 typewriter pushing Rockford Files, Berettas, Kojaks, Columbos through the machine, typing up generous chunks of films with titles like Animal House and Coal Miner's Daughter and uh, Melvin and Howard. And I loved wandering around the Universal lot in my spare time. And I didn't understand people that just saw it as you punch in, you do your job, you punch out. Because it was like, wow, this is the stage where Cheney senior film Phantom of the Opera and the balcony seats are still there. And uh, I would often see Hitchcock uh, being driven in in a dark green Lincoln. He would be in the back seat. Um, and I got to meet, I didn't care that much about the contemporaneous stars. It didn't matter to me to see Lee Majors or Lindsay Wagner or someone like that. But I tried to keep track of who was guest starring uh, in some of the shows. So I got to meet Fred Astaire on the set of, of all the unlikely places, Battlestar Galactica, <laughs> the original series, because his grandson loved the show and said, Grandpa, will you be on that? And so he arranged for it. So I was able to meet him. I met Lauren Bacall on the set of The Rockford Files. Uh, she was filming a two-parter for which she ended up winning an, uh, an Emmy Award. So I, I loved the atmosphere and soaking up the history and also the, the then current uh, energy of all the TV shows and movies they had cooking. Uh, but I wasn't satisfied just being a typist and eventually became a production secretary, but still I was on the other side of the desk. Um, I had become friends with Dick Cavett through my Groucho connection. We started corresponding and uh, he, he was fascinated because I was a pipeline into the intrigue at Groucho's house because Aaron Fleming, the ambitious and unbalanced actress who had become basically in charge of Groucho's life, there was a substantial feud between her and Groucho's children uh, over control of him and his estate. And uh, when Groucho died, I figured, well, I guess that's it for my Cabot connection because why what reason does he have for staying in touch with me? And the week Groucho died, he called me from New York and he said, listen, I hope just because Groucho's gone, we're not going to lose touch. And by the way, I hope you don't mind, but I've shown some of your letters to Woody and he says they're very well written. So I poured the urine out of my shoes. And thought, <laughs> this is cool. He's calling me to say, let's stay in touch. So we, we did correspond. And in 78, I flew to New York and actually met him. Uh, he was taping his PBS show with New Yorker writers and Gore Vidal. That was a good day to show up for taping. And I was nervous for about, 20 seconds, and then it was like we had gone to junior high together. So he had a deal at HBO, and in 1982, he told HBO to hire me to write for the show. 
Um, and so I ended up moving from LA to New York and uh, leaving being a secretary. It was weird. I, I left LAX as a secretary and touched down at JFK as a writer. Uh, and I realized I could speak with an accent or limp or something and no one there would know that wasn't the real me because they had nothing to compare it to. But I was myself and that was, I mean, my whole New York adventure was a fascinating two and a half years. And then work dried up there and I ended up being hired back in LA by the guy I had been working for as a production secretary, writer, producer named Bill Dial. And he hired me as a writer on the show and so I ended up moving back and then being a freelance writer uh, for various shows, Simon and Simon and uh, uh, Murder, She Wrote and the new WKRP in Cincinnati and Sliders. Who are we looking at here? So this was a oh, KRP. Th this was the new WKRP for folks not only listening right now. Uh, we have Les Nessman here Les with the Nessman. cast of the new WKRP in Cincinnati, and they're doing the parody of the YouTube Numb video with oh. uh, with the Edge, and which which it's it's actually a really good parody. I've but... never seen this. I certainly didn't write it. <laughs> I wrote two episodes of the show, and it was a lot of fun. Why? I, I was going to ask you, like, why did they bring that show back? I, I because it, there were a couple of things I knew. Um, so getting a chance to know uh, uh, some people and talk to uh, people with WKRP and uh, uh, Hugh Wilson has talked about it as well. Is the original show was uh, there was always problems with the network with CBS and that there was um, there was issues with content and everything and especially the uh, the, the who concert in 1979 they're like ah don't, don't do an episode like that he's like we're a show that's supposed to be based in Cincinnati about a radio station how do we not bring up one of the biggest things to happen to a rock concert so there was always like a lot of back and forth yeah. with the network but then by the time the new WKRP came out in the 90s the biggest problem was the music royalties that they weren't able to get them that they were relatively cheap in the 70s by the 90s they needed to be renewed and then they had to start redubbing a lot of stuff for the vhs and the dvd and it just yeah. oof, didn't really work out but I, I i don't understand what like were people in the 90s clamoring for w i, I mean it's it's great that you got a gig know, out of it <laughs> i don't know how it worked in that case with bringing a show back and with a slightly different cast um, Bill Dial had worked on the initial show. As a matter of fact, he wrote he wrote Turkeys Away, which is maybe the most famous episode where they're pushing turkeys out of the helicopter and they're they're slamming into the ground and Les Nessman is narrating it as if it were the Hindenburg. <laughs> disaster it's one of the greats I, in fact i have that sticker on my jeep right now as a bumper sticker that says as god is my witness i thought turkeys could fly well bill dial <laughs> wrote that line and he was he was exec producer on the re uh reworking of it and um i you know i people pitch ideas and uh net you know Network people are fans of something or open-minded or looking for a vehicle for a certain person. And, uh, you know, I certainly wasn't privy to the machinations of how it came to be, but was happy to get uh, a couple of script assignments. And yeah, that was an er early French steward here. It yeah. was part of the cast and Tawny Katane and, uh, right. but yeah, it, that uh, it was and then you know you had herb tarlick you had you know some of the the, the characters gordon jump who was uh right. he was he was the maytag repairman for a long time but he was also trying to kind of get away from that uh different strokes episode that uh you know kind of dried up work for him for a little bit but uh yeah i mean well, that was he, a show that, <laughs> that was he interesting. came back from the he was one of those from the original cast that that uh was happy to have a comfortable uh, role that he knew so well and a regular gig for a while. I know one of my one of the two episodes I wrote, uh, but Les thinks he's dying, so he decides to finally be a risk taker and and 
gets a motorcycle. So I, the name of the episode was Then Came Nessman. <laughs> as, a, as a parody of Then Came Bronson, which was a motorcycle show earlier than that. But uh, anyway, it was fun and a great experience and the checks cleared and like that. There you go. But you've all, but of course, and then a couple of years after that is when you got into writing the book about staying with Groucho came out. I believe the first edition was 1996, right? Yeah. So you put that out and you've been kind of busy, even whether it's promoting that and, uh, but you, you stayed active. You even did voiceover stuff for Charlie Brown cartoons as well. Uh, yeah, I got to work with Bill Melendez. Who, I was going to ask that if you work with Lee Mendelson and Bill Melendez and of course Sparky. I didn't meet, uh, Mendelson. I didn't meet Sparky because he lived up north. Although because of my work on the shows, I do now have a, uh, a first edition of Snoopy and the Red Baron that's Ooh. signed to me from Schultz with a drawing of Snoopy. So that that's was, incredible. But I got to work with Bill a lot and he was just this unassuming salt of the earth great guy. That was something I found at Groucho's was that the people who had made a success of themselves and didn't really have to worry about it were really down to earth, normal, regular guys. And it was the young people getting their first taste of fame that had the, I don't think you know who I am. I don't, you, you don't address me that way. That kind of an attitude thing. Bill was a great guy. And uh, yeah, I got to do voice work on a number of uh, Melinda's things, Snoopy stuff and also I was brought in to do some voices on um, on the sequel to Frosty the Snowman called Frosty Returns. And I remember thinking, oh, maybe CBS will run this at, right after Frosty every year and it'll become a cherished, beloved perennial holiday show. And sure enough, every year, I get a fairly sizable residual check because they always staple it to the classic Frosty the Snowman show. Oh, yes. Um, but that was, see, that was a great experience too because some of the other people doing the voices were Andrea Martin and That's John CTV. Goodman and uh, um, uh, Brian Doyle Murray. And then the little girl who was the star of it, uh, I don't remember her vividly, except that she was very professional and knew her stuff. And you can imagine my surprise when she grew up to star in Handmaid's Tale and Mad Men. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be interesting to run into her now. Um, Elizabeth Moss Elizabeth Moss yeah she's a big star now but she was just a little girl at the time uh, I like John Goodman a lot anyway it was a great experience and now you know once a year CBS announces it's you know Rudolph and Santa and Frosty and Frosty returns and there there's my vocalizing uh, a few of the characters did you get a chance to meet Jonathan Winters? Sadly, no. He was they hadn't cast the narrator yet. Okay. So all the other stuff was done with us. You know, so many things are done separately now, and then because of COVID and and now with Zoom and all that, uh, most voice stuff is done uh, in home studios and then is mixed later. But this was still back in the days when you all showed had the same call time and you show we showed up at a place called buzzy's recording studio where a lot of stuff was done over the years and stood around microphones and and played off each other and we also there were a couple of songs there was frosty and then there was another one about 
uh, about snow of all the unlikely subjects. And uh, so I got to interact with them and uh, uh, Jan Hooks was in it. She was very nice. It was really cool. Yeah, because I'm I'm looking at the original. Of course, you have you have Paul Fries, you have June Foray, Jackie yeah. Vernon, and everything. And then eventually, a lot of those had either passed away, retired. Even though June Foray was working up until like a couple of years ago. Oh yeah, <laughs> until she was 99. But uh, yeah, the, the, you started getting to the 90s and when they needed star power a after Robin Williams and uh, the and Aladdin. Then the next big Disney movie was The Lion King, and then it was every A-list actor you can fit who can voice something in a show. So it kind of, I, I could tell in the voice acting community, it rubbed people the wrong way a little bit yeah. where they, they said, okay, so you're just going after star power to bill it as opposed to, Hey, um, you know, I can sing. I have a very distinct voice and, but you know, they claim they're not bitter, but. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it, it narrowed the possibilities because one of the things that I consider a strong suit of mine is impressions and character voices but what if you run into well we don't want someone who sounds like them we'll just get them or if it's an old character actor then they'd say well no one knows who that is anymore even though if you don't know the name it could still be the the voice of a, a, a scientist or a grandpa or something like that so yes they have uh Oh, and then the music was done by the guy, uh, uh, not Talking Heads. What's the... Is it uh, Mark Mothersbaugh? Yes. What was his group? Was uh, he, was with D he was with Devo, just, uh, Devo, just, up yeah. the road, just down the road from me. Oh, all right. Well, That's I was it. close to Talking Heads because they were about the same time. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's, it, yeah. It, it's it's interesting because uh, when you really like I'm not saying you, but like when people out there who don't know who Bill Melendez is, he was the ultimate renaissance man of of animation for basically most of the 20th century going from the he Looney Tunes every, cartoons. He was in every right place at the right time. He was at Disney in the 40s and Warner Brothers in the 50s. And then went out on his own and everyone knows what happened after the Charlie Brown Christmas. That was not meant to be the first Charlie Brown special. That was meant to be the Charlie Brown special. Yes. There was no plan to do any other holidays or anything. It was just a special deal, one off. And of course, now it is people love it. And I'm happy when younger just as i'm happy when someone says my granddaughter's nine and was laughing at harpo it sort of warms my heart to think that there's a new generation so now kids grow up still watching uh charlie brown christmas and learning and becoming familiar with vince garaldi's jazz soundtrack which was very unusual at the time also um the network wanted adult actors with kids' voices, the typical kind of June Foray as a little place like Rocky, little girl thing. And Bill was the one who said, let's use real kids. And of course, now you can't imagine it without, even though there was an awkwardness to their delivery, it was real. All I want is my fair share. All I want. And so the shepherds, and, you know, it, it was real. And now, you know, all the all the peanut specials after that, it was always a matter of casting real kids, uh, basically emulating the original slate of actors that had been hired for the Christmas show. Yeah, and I believe Bill was the only one who was the adult who voiced anything, which is he was the voice of when Snoopy would make noises and when you're ah! yes, <laughs> yes, uh, I I didn't. You know, people uh, people say, "Oh, you did Charlie Brown voices." What were you, the muted trumpet going? <laughs> no, I mean, I I was a, a, a bus driver. I was a uh, a farmer in an episode where where uh, Charlie Brown adopts Snoopy. It was like a flashback to there. I remember that. Yeah, it's the Daisy Hill Puppy Farm. 
Yeah. Oh, I was the farmer. And when we were playing around with voices, uh, Bill and I both thought it would be fun if I was, sounded like Lionel Barrymore. <laughs> but Schultz didn't, didn't want to do that. So I was a more generic old guy. I, I, see, I, I would have preferred if you were able to uh, do your Sig Ruman impression. I have a puppy here that is covered with black spots. <laughs> and I can make for you a good price if you want to adopt this one. I've, I've never heard anybody do a Sig Ruman. I, I talked to Billy West about a year and a half ago, and I said, you know, you do all the Stooges voices, but I never hear you do an Emil Sitka. And he's like, yeah, you know what? I, I really haven't. And I haven't heard anybody do one other than oh, just hands, saying. Oh, you love birds. Yeah, people, <laughs> it's not that, yeah. There's certain people that have distinctive voices, and yet it's like um, no one could do Bob Hope until SCTV showed us the way. Till Dave Thomas. And Til actually, Dave that's a, th that's yeah. an interesting transition because I wanted to ask you about that because you had an opportunity to get to know Arthur Marks, who was Groucho's son, his first son and only son. And uh he uh, he was also a longtime TV writer, and um, you know he he had a lot of stuff. He worked for, for Norman Lear and a couple of other productions and stuff. But he also had wrote a, a lot of books, and one of his most prolific books was the book on Bob Hope, and which came out when Hope was still alive. I think he was oh, ninety. Yeah. Decades, right that it time. came out in the seventies. And so, so I, uh, and I, I told you this off the air, but, uh, so I, I interviewed Dave Thomas about two years ago and I brought both books. I have the Richard Zoglin, Bob Hope book, the entertainer of the century. And then I have the, uh, Arthur Marks, Bob Hope book. And I said, which one is the real deal? And he said, if you want a fluff piece on how great of an entertainer Bob Hope is and everything, read the Zoglin book. If you want to know the true stories and a lot of stuff that uh, you know that uh, Dolores didn't want to know about and she didn't know about for a long time and everybody else, then read the uh, Arthur Marks books. So to, uh, talk about like what what was Arthur like? Did he have vendettas going on with especially Bob Hope? But he also had a very complicated relationship with his father as well. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I should say that I didn't get to know Arthur well because Arthur viewed me as someone from the Aaron Fleming camp. Mm. Because in fairness to Aaron, she was the one who hired me to work at Groucho's as his secretary and archivist. And so Arthur always viewed me with suspicion. And then he, he had had falling outs with his dad over the years, but Aaron really drove a wedge uh, such that Arthur was persona non grata for a couple of years at Groucho's house. So I didn't see him at all um, after my initial days there in 74. Uh, I did, I reconnected with him at Universal when I was working for Bill Dial. He came in to pitch stories and it was kind of nice, you know, it's like all the drama was out of the way and uh, it was nice to see him, and he seemed to enjoy reconnecting with me. And I said, how's Miriam, uh, who is the older of the two daughters, who had a very rough life with substance abuse and institutionalizing, but apparently of his three children was the one that really inherited Groucho's brilliance. So she, it's like she paid a price for that. And I, so I said, how's Miriam doing? Expecting him to say, well, she's in a different place and they're hopeful or something. Instead, he said, uh, uh, she doesn't drink anymore. Uh, she, uh, I guess now that dad's gone, she doesn't have a reason to. Wow. Interesting insight there. Hmm. Um, Arthur... He didn't have I don't he didn't have a vendetta. I think he just realized that books sell better when they've got dirt. Okay. Frankly, you know, I mean, and when I set out to write raised eyebrows, I didn't want to write a puff piece on Groucho and downplay the people that had difficult personalities and sugarcoat him having gotten older and hazier. Nor did I want to make him a pitiful figure that would have been going too far the other way 
and or soft pedaling a lot of the positive elements. There was no point in doing that. So I just set, set out to tell a balanced, true version of my experience there. And I think I succeeded because half the people say you were too easy on Aaron Fleming and the other half say you were too hard on her. So I guess I must have struck the right balance. But yeah, Arthur, he wasn't known for being a really skilled writer, but his book sold and he had, uh, you know, as you said, he, he, he was on uh, Alice, the, the staff of Alice sitcom for years and uh, he did all right. But I think, you know, his stuff was like workmanlike. It wasn't lousy and it wasn't distinctive. But uh, interesting, because uh, like because I, I always thought that when that was he somebody that like hope screwed him over with with pay or or on a project or something. And he's like, well, I'll show this son of a bitch no. that I'm going to go after him. OK, so I was, I was wondering that. Not to my knowledge. No, I mean, and he knew hope from the you know, numerous interactions of his father. Um, I can't remember if Arthur worked on any of the specials or latter day hope films, but uh, he, they certainly knew each other. And I'm guessing uh, hope was displeased with the end product, but uh, you know, and he did one on Dean Martin and yeah, that's true. Yeah. that was also a, unflattering um i mean there's a number of people who have talked about what a great guy dean martin was and a regular guy unassuming blah 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 um but arthur went for the the scandalous angle and um i get I, the one phrase the one phrase that stayed with me from arthur's book on dean martin was something along the lines of Dean Martin considered making love as sacred as blowing his nose. Isn't that <laughs> lovely? You know, how do you get around that saying, well, no, no, I didn't mean it in a negative way. Um, and even, you know, even in Son of Groucho, he's, and then he, he put Life with Groucho and Son of Groucho together and came out with a book called My Life with Groucho, which was sort of, both books and then his take on the recent years and you know was quite bitter and snide uh in different places so uh anyway so i never really got to know him well and i really disliked his wife lois mm. who was a shrew and uh and and the interesting thing is uh, let's see if I can explain this without tripping over my tongue. Arthur, Arthur's first wife, Irene, was the daughter of Grace and Gus Kahn, the songwriters. Okay. Grace and Gus Kahn also had a son named Donald. So Donald and Lois, no, Donald and Irene were the children of the Kahn. Arthur was married to Irene. He divorced her to marry Donald's wife, Lois. And I don't think Groucho ever quite forgave him because he, he really liked Irene and he really got, a, he was great friends with Gus Kahn and Grace Kahn from vaudeville days. And great, Gus Kahn wrote songs for at the, the day at the races and they had a long history. And in fact, uh, Irene Khan Marx was continued to be invited to Groucho's parties when I was there. Um, she was still welcome in the house, even though Lois wasn't, who was Arthur's current wife. So, you know, they had their ups and downs over various things over the years, but Aaron really drove that wedge when she came on the scene. Well, it, um, uh, yeah, so I, I had an opportunity to go. I've, I've been to LA a few times, and I'm actually right now I'm wearing a Vince Scully T-shirt 
because uh, I uh, the time when I went out to California was actually Vin Scully's last home game that he called for the L.A. Dodgers at Dodger Stadium. So and then they won on a walk off and they went to the playoffs and everything. And it was and then he sang to the crowd. He sang Wind Beneath My Wings. It was really cool. Wow. But it was like part of my uh, it, it was a weird trip going out to L.A. because I was dating a girl at the time who thought that I was going to propose to her on Santa Monica Pier. I had no ring and I had no intention of proposing to her. My thing was I wanted to go see the baseball game and I wanted to go Hollywood Walk of Fame as I have a picture here with uh, with the Groucho Marx star. And then I went out to Eden Cemetery yeah. and saw where Groucho is located uh, here. This Yeah, this 2016, I was, I was out there. So I wanted to retrace a little bit of those steps. I didn't get a chance to go to... Uh, uh, Hillcrest to uh, over uh, Beverly Hills, where his house was. But, it's been uh, so remade that it, it. Someone just yesterday sent me like the Zillow listing for Groucho's house. It's up for sale again for like twenty million dollars. But uh, one of the things I did when I when the book my book was reissued was there's a chapter on what has become of the people I wrote about since the original book came out. And one of the things I talk about is going back into Groucho's house, uh, like 25 years after the fact, because it was up for sale. And a friend of mine said, let's go, you and me be looky loos. And I thought, ooh, that's a weird thing. But I went, I went, and it was it was weird. It was like I was, I was haunting my old house, but it wasn't even cosmetically changed. It was structurally changed. Mm. And I sort of I felt like a blind psychic walking along and saying, "This wall wasn't here. That was Groucho. That that the bathroom was was where that wall is." Um, they moved the pool a few feet in one direction. I don't know why you spend the money to do that, but it really wasn't his house anymore. So the address is the same, but it, it, it really, if they're, st if they're still selling it as a house designed by Wallace Neff, who was a very popular mid-century architect, they are misrepresenting it because it was made over into an ultra modern thing in the 90s oh, yeah the it, it's it's amazing because uh when i was out there and i was like this i think i had your book with me when i was out in uh in, in california i was kind of trying to retrace the steps and everything so i'm kind of glad i didn't go there but uh i think i was trying to go out he may have been in um Oh, gosh, it, he may have been in Pasadena. I'm not sure, but Frank Ferrante was performing as Groucho, and he was doing something out there. And what do, what were your thoughts on Frank Ferrante's Groucho? And what were your thoughts on Gabe Kapler's, uh, or Gabe Kaplan, not Gabe Kapler, the baseball player, Gabe Kaplan from Welcome Back, <laughs> Cotter? Did a one man show as Groucho? What did you think about them? Well, I'm a I'm a tough crowd. Uh, my my. Uh seismograph is a lot more sensitive uh, than others are in terms of people doing like one man shows as famous people or biopics of famous people. But, you know, he has, he has delighted thousands of people and there is no denying his, his affection for and attachment to Groucho, and he had the blessing of the family. Um, so, you know, I, I w will still prefer to watch the original, actual Groucho, but I certainly don't begrudge people who have the time of their lives at his show. And what were your thoughts on Minnie's Boys? It was mediocre and interesting um there's a wonderful letter from sj perelman to al hirschfeld uh apparently the tryouts on minnie's boys and it's like 69 or 70 they thought i know let's throw some money at perelman he'll come in and fix it and his letter to hirschfeld was like 
last night an ambulance arrived and I was rushed to the to the bedside of an ailing play called Minnie's Boys. Laughs there were none and tunes were unhummable and I basically like this this patient isn't going to make it through the night. I'm not going to get involved in this. Mm. Um, but, you know, I know that Louis J. Stadlin was really lauded for his performance of Groucho and that Groucho enjoyed it. Um, I just didn't think all that much of it. But as I say, I'm, I'm a tough crowd. I'm, I, I'm, it's hard. You know, there's a lot of times there'll be movies with someone playing a famous person and people will say, it's uncanny. It's like he's possessed by the spirit of that person. It's, you'd swear it was him. And then I would go and I'd say, he did a good job. It's, yeah, that, that's, yeah, he did it. But I never really suspended this belief and felt that I was watching whoever it was, that certainly not Rod Steiger's W.C. Fields. Or, I thought Jim Carrey did a very, very good job as Andy Kaufman. But I don't know that I ever felt like I was watching Andy Kaufman. Uh, I think Downey Jr. did about as good a chaplain as you could do, although it probably shouldn't have tried to span all those years, including when he was an old man. But in his heyday, I thought he kind of captured Chaplin. And I think there were a few moments where it felt as if I were watching him. But for the most part, you know, the safest thing to do with, with a movie about someone famous is either to do them when they were much younger than when they were famous or way after the fact so that you're not slamming into the real thing. For instance, in Ed Wood, Lugosi is in his final days. And so you're not really coming up against Dracula and uh, Murders in the Rue Morgue and the Raven and all that. You're dealing with the Ed Wood period of his life. And so likewise with the film version of Raised Eyebrows, it's not a, you know, I read, I, I keep reading that it's a biopic of Groucho, which is news to me and the director and the star. <laughs> uh, it is not a biopic anymore, you know, talking about Ed Wood, any more than Ed Wood was the Bela Lugosi story. That was yeah. a story about a fanatic, ambitious, young, quirky director who got to befriend his hero in his frail final day. And that's similar to what raised eyebrows in. And we have Jeffrey Rush, who is champing at the bit to play the old Groucho, but there's not going to be you know, if there's anything in it about the earlier years, it would be watching actual clips the same way uh, Martin Landau watched uh, White Zombie on TV and it was the actual footage. So I think you could, at least for my taste, you can get away that sort of fudging the, the uh, suspension of disbelief if they're, I remember seeing Before the Rainbow with Andrea McCardle as the young, as like pre-famous Judy Garland. And you weren't constantly butting up against the image of her in Oz and Meet Me in St. Louis because she was just an adolescent. Mm -hmm. um, that makes it sound as if Minnie's Boys would have been a good idea. And maybe it was a good idea. I just didn't think the result was you know it was okay it, se it seemed like a lot of people are trying to do the hal holbrook method where it's it's like you take the what he d did with mark twain for all those years and it's just like yeah no you know just go with that and make the character your own but as somebody who actually knew groucho and i think frank ferrante said he once met groucho as a teenager briefly at least, you know, you have a little bit more of that inside and saying like, yeah, Groucho wouldn't have probably, Groucho wouldn't yeah, have responded that's, that's like that. That's why I'm not the best uh, litmus test. You know, like I say, my my seismograph is, is a lot more sensitive than most people. 
And most people, I mean, there's no, no shortage of rave notices about his show on the information superhighway. So I think I'm, you know, I'm not the best person to give a balanced view because I was perhaps too close to the subject. And, and same thing for Gabe Kaplan, who again was a, was a big Groucho fanatic. Um, I don't know, I just, when I'll hear that, oh, they're doing a movie on someone, you know, the Laurel and Hardy movie came close. The Oliver Hardy was eerily close to the real guy. And maybe that was a little more successful for my, you know, uh, microscopic judging brain. Um, but it, it's, it's like, if you're going to do them when there's a constant barrage of the real footage to, to look at, it asks a lot of the performer or the makeup person or whoever or everybody to really make you feel that there is that person. Yeah, it's uh, well, and, you know, and then you, you would have to deal with uh, as far as casting goes, because the like who would play you, for example? <laughs> well, his name is um, Charlie Plummer and okay. he looks we look enough alike to be neighbors. Uh, there is, there isn't really a resemblance, but the truth is, in a case like Steve at twenty, uh, who cares? My sisters and and my cousins in St. Louis will care, but it isn't necessary that Steve looks just like the young Steve because that's not the point of it. Because you're not pushing against people's preconceived images of it and you know he will still he'll have the mutton chops and he'll have this shaggy hair and all that but it isn't necessary that he uh that he really look or sound like me and even with aaron fleming um I could see, I, oh, I could see that a little bit with the hair. If he keeps the hair, yeah, I could definitely see that. Well, we're going to, we will bring back the seventies, Mister Moverman and I. <laughs> I. I like it. Um, and apparently, he's a young, hot, rising star. Because you know, for years, people would say, "Who do you want to play you?" And I would say, "I'm sure it will be someone I'm not familiar with because I don't have my thumb on the pulse of twenty-year-old actors." And they would suggest, they would say, oh, well, what about Matthew Broderick? It's like, he's 47 now. You know, <laughs> people that, anyone that's like friends with me has also lost sight of the fact that people who had been 20, you know, Leo, Leo DiCaprio, you know, is now this like late middle-aged actor instead of this boyish faced kid. So, the turnover in young actors, you know, in the, in the years that I've been trying to get the film off the ground, so many people have come and gone. So many young people have grown into older people and so many of the older actors have died or retired. So you have to stay flexible. And, you know, the bottom line is, do they have the chops to, to play that role? And Oren has worked with Charlie Plummer on a couple of films. And he's very impressed with him and has zero doubts about his ability to play me, uh, which, which actually Oren feels is possibly the most important of the three characters, three main characters, because mm -hmm. he's the one that is the one whose eyes the audience is seeing all these things unfold so they have to be able to relate to him um anyway i uh, not sure when it will be filmed but i'm glad the writer's strike is over and i'm glad as we're recording this that it looks like the sag strike is being the, the finally hammering out a deal excellent um, but yeah it's going to be and it will be of course surreal to walk onto the set of a film based on something from my life and see people playing people I knew, including someone playing me. 
That's, I mean, it's whatever meta means, that's it. Really is surreal. Um, yeah. and, and then also, especially in those last couple of years, like you said, that there were people who come and go. And it's funny because uh, with me having read Raised Eyebrows a couple of times, knowing a, your story, knowing the story from those years from 77 or 74 to 77, um, you know, Groucho strokes, Groucho uh, having the, as as everyone says, had the worst timing for the only time he's ever had bad timing. He passes away the week Elvis died. And um, three days after. But it, it's, I, I'll it, never forgive Presley. Every year, <laughs> TCM will have their Elvis week. And it reminds me, oh, it's Groucho week too. Because it's so overshadowed all the press. All the time. Like, it's like uh, we'll be back with more coverage of the death of the king three days ago. Oh, and by the way, Groucho Marx died. We'll be back after these messages. And I believe you said that, or and I think you, you quoted in the book that uh, Dick Cavett and Woody Allen both said, hey, there were other kings who died this week as well. Yeah, they. I think they both had letters published in Time magazine, and the gist was... Was it our imagination or was short shrift given to the death of the great Groucho? So, yeah, that's yeah, that they were uh, they were loyal. So it, it's it's funny when, you know, and, and by the way, folks, again, get the book Raised Eyebrows and you've got a lot of great pictures that were taken and all, all that get like there's there's the scene of uh, Groucho in bed and. You have uh, you have Gloria and you have Archie Bunker in, in there and yeah. Jack Lemon and all the amount of stars. But one picture in particular always floats up on social media uh, and people are shocked to know about this. But if you really think about it and you really dig in, they shouldn't be shocked. And it's this picture I'm showing here on the YouTube page. And it's a picture of an Alice Cooper when he was still doing his uh, when he was still drinking in those days. Yes. And he's drinking a Budweiser next to Groucho. Product, product placement. <laughs> so well, so talk here's, talk here's, talk a little bit about oh I'm I, sorry I was actually that? I was there that was at the day at the races fundraiser uh out at some farm racetrack in in 74 um Groucho was friends with Alice Cooper he he got a kick out of him um you know I I think he said something like you know, he, he's, he's bringing back vaudeville single-handedly with his show. But people make the mistake of thinking that Groucho liked his music. And Groucho hated rock and roll. I mean, he grew up... Groucho was born when, when Gilbert and Sullivan were still writing operettas. And not and, Gilbert O. Sullivan. No, no. Uh, <laughs> Alone again, naturally. Claire, anyway, Gilbert <laughs> and Sullivan, HMS Pinafore and Mikado. And, all. and Groucho's music was the music of Tin Pan Alley, you know, Berlin, Gershwin, Porter, Kern, uh, Rogers and Hart. That's what he loved. And c coincidentally, Gilbert and Sullivan. And, you know, when rock started ascending in the 50s, he had. And he's to be forgiven, I think, since he was from 1890, that he just didn't really care for Presley and, and Jerry Lee Lewis. And so, you know, by the time you get into the psychedelic loud stuff of the late 60s and 70s, it was just of no interest. In. As a matter of fact, there was one time I was taking him to a uh, doctor's appointment and he was in the passenger seat of my car. And I always and still do have the radio on just as like white noise in the background. And I tended to listen to top 40 radio. It wasn't, it wasn't like underground FM that played weird feedback, screechy, yelling stuff. It was, you know, pretty middle of the road. Muskrat but, Love. Yes, or yeah, or Elton Starland John, Vocal Band and James stuff like that. Taylor, yeah. Well, no, we got halfway down Hillcrest and Groucho said, do we have to have that? And I said, no, no. And I turned it off. And, <laughs> and so, you know, people see him photographed with Gary Glitter and with Elton John 
and with Queen because they had a night at the opera and day at the races LPs named after his film. But those were more a photo op because it, it kept Groucho relevant because look, he's hanging out with these current rock people. And then it was a shot in the arm for them because look, this legend is spending time with us. Aren't we cool? So it was like a mutual publicity thing. But you know, he did genuinely like uh, Alice, but it, it didn't have anything to do with the music. And also, I recently heard that uh, Alice was saying Groucho would call him up and uh, in the middle of the night and Cooper would come over with a six pack and, and the two of them would polish it off and watch. The, and it's like, I, I can't just say that's not true because I wasn't there. But Groucho was never much of a drinker, even in, in his youth. He certainly was absolutely forbidden to have anything alcoholic at this point in his life and with all the medications he was on. And he, he would, you know, if, if Cooper came over with a six pack of Bud and left with six empty cans, the, the beer was in his stomach. None of it was in Groucho's. So <laughs> there was perhaps a bit of exaggeration there. But yes, it is an interesting now and then photo although the now is already 50 years ago but uh it is as it appears it is not artificial intelligence or photoshop well because in your book you mention about how the stars of the new hollywood in the days of the uh you know post mash the robert altman films the when elliot gould would come over and sally kellerman and they all knew who Groucho was. And there was this resurgence with baby boomers that it's like, Oh, we, we love Groucho because he watching duck soup. He's very anti-establishment. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're talking about the Vietnam days and everything. So Groucho had this nice resurgence once again, coming into the seventies, which is why you guys, you were able to get him over there to bring back animal crackers at UCLA and everything like that. It, again, all this stuff's in the book, but it, it was, what's fascinating is like with this picture with Alice Cooper, is that people knew that it was good to be photographed with someone like Groucho because years from now, you'd look at pictures and like, look, I was with Groucho Marx. And it really was kind of like a, a it, in today's world, what the millennials and Zoomers would say is clout. It's you, you doing it for clout. And it kind of seemed that way. You're like, oh, you got a picture with Groucho Marx. That's amazing. But well, if they're millennials, they're saying who? Not me. I'm a millennial. My cat, his name is Harpo. <laughs> There's Gen Xers who have absolutely no idea who the March brothers are. That's a shame. And but I've gotten past being upset and well, they and know they know arrogant. Richard Marx. They know Richard uh, Marx. Yes. But that's about it. <laughs> uh, and it's all it, it's gotten to the point where it's a pleasant surprise if I say to someone, have do you know who Groucho Marx was? And they say, of course I know who he is. You think I'm an idiot? It's like, I love to hear that. But more often, it's a blank stare when I bring up the name. So I, I find myself explaining. And of course, it still doesn't mean any. Well, in the 30s and in the 20s on Broadway and in the 30s, Paramount. It's like, they, I haven't seen those movies. I don't watch black and white stuff. Uh, if it if it came out after Star Wars, I haven't seen it or after Titanic or what, you know, it's like pop culture is a burning bridge behind them. Because, you know, even when I was a kid, it wasn't as if Duck Soup and Top Hat and Frankenstein were first run. And I was, you know, going out in the snow during the Depression to pay to, to lose myself in these movies. They were already decades old, but all my friends and I knew who all these actors were, and we would watch classic films on TV in the weekend afternoons and all that. And it's just, uh, I think because it, it's a strange paradox because stuff, all these old things are so available now. I mean, Animal Crackers hadn't been seen in decades, and it was this big effort to pressure Universal to clear the rights 
and strike new prints and bring it out. And now you can pull this gizmo out of your pocket and hit a couple of buttons and there it is, you know, on YouTube or something. So it's much easier to access the stuff, but because there's been such an explosion of that awful word content, what a bland cardboardy word that is. But it's true. And with younger, and by younger, I mean, you know, below 50 now, with younger people, it asks more of them to sit through black and white, God forbid, a silent movie. And then if you really want to clear the room, have them sit down for an old radio drama like an Orson Welles broadcast or something. You can't see it. You can't. Um, so I, it's disappointing, but I'm not surprised anymore when people will, okay, I have a great nephew. I don't mean he's terrific, although he is, but he's technically a great nephew. He's in his early teens and his niece or his mother is my niece. And she said, Evan doesn't have any idea who Dustin Hoffman is. Oh, goodness. And, and I thought that's and Evan's really smart and really savvy about a lot of pop culture things. He had no idea. Now, it would be easy to say, oh, well, then he's an idiot or, well, he must live in a closet or something like that. But you think about what well, what has Dustin Hoffman's career been in the last 15 years it's it's the Ben Stiller meet the Fockers, I believe, is about it for for, for as far as um, a so, lot of mainstream. So if you popularity. haven't seen that, then you don't know who he is. So, uh, you know, it's a little startling, but I, I've gotten past assuming that people know who Ed Sullivan and Fred Astaire and Clark Gable, and, you know, I the W C Fields. You can't you can't do that or you'll get a blank stare. But as I say, it's gratifying when they go, oh yeah, it's one of my favorite movies. I think what helped with the baby boomer generation was when TV, when, when people started getting televisions in their homes, they also needed to fill some airtime. Yes. And that's why in, you know, in, in New York, you would, you would have channel nine and uh, you, you'd have a lot of other, so you, you play a lot of the universal horror movies back right. in the day. You play a lot of Paramount stuff and the musicals. And so if you were a kid who was, you, you know, you, 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 either you were really sick or you faked sick, you had an opportunity all day to watch some of these old movies because they were filling airtime. There wasn't enough content and you were kind of getting your own film school in those days, which is why I think yeah. my parents passed a lot of this on to me, especially my mom going all the way into the early days of AMC before they had original programming right. all the way to Turner classic movies when, uh, <laughs> right around the time when, uh, uh I believe, uh, was it Orson Welles right before he died? He said something mm -hmm. like, uh, tell turn, tell Ted Turner to keep his goddamn crayons off of my movies. <laughs> oh, that was when Turner, Turner had bought the rights to Citizen Kane and said, I can do whatever I want with it. If I want to put it out in color, I can put it out in color. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then he bought all the MGM and all the, this entire library. He, he wanted to colorize you know, he everything. Ended, he went from being the bane of cinema enthusiasts the, the just the ugly American who's going to buy up classics and paint them garish colors to creating the greatest preservation archive and allowing us to see, you know, TCM shows so much like old Vitaphone shorts and, you know, programmer, RKO programmers with, with second string stars or lesser movies by great people that you hadn't seen before, in addition to, you know, Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind. Uh, so yeah, Turner, we were wrong about Ted, but, uh, but you're right. We had limited channels and the channels had limited content. And so there were all these syndicated packages of the universal horror films and Paramount comedies and, uh, you know, gangster movies and Errol Flynn movies. But now there's just such a choice 
And why would you want to slow down your attention span with references to things that you don't get and you can't tell what color it is and there's no special effects of just standing around talking. And it doesn't do any good to say, but it's still compelling, but it's great. It's, it's you know, if, if, if it doesn't appeal to them, you can't make them like it. All you can do is expose it to them. And if they respond, that's cool. And if they don't, that's just how it goes, you know? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, with the amount of content that's, you know, again, that word again, that's <sighs> out there right now that, it, like, again, we have, th this show that uh, people are watching are, is on YouTube. If you They're want, watching. you can click this off. As soon as you're done with this, watching this, you can find almost anything. In fact, just look up Groucho Marx. There's a whole compilation of all his quick-witted one-liners and everything, whether it's from You Bet Your Life or from the movies or television appearances with Dick Cavett. And they're out there and they're really funny and you can go check that out. Or you can go on TikTok and watch some girl dance uh, next to her baby who has COVID, which I, was something I actually saw today. You'll uh, have to send me the link by. to that. <laughs> to each his goo, as the French say. Uh, That's what... sans, sans goo. Well, uh, but again, it, you it... can't make people like something. And if they grew up with the internet and and streaming and all that, it's hard to turn back the clock and say, slow things down, listen, listen to this radio show, how it's all happening in your mind, the sound effects, you're imagining. It's like, I don't wanna have to imagine it. I wanna see it in giant screen with special effects and, and stereo and hit the pause if I wanna leave the room. Ah. Anyway. That's, why, that's why I enjoyed going when I was out in L.A. is that I not only went to go see Groucho's where, where he's at. I also went to Lenny Bruce's grave, which there's the <laughs> there's the rumor that apparently uh, Freddie Prince was uh, having sex with Lenny Bruce's daughter, Kitty, I believe, on his grave. I mean, there's a rumor, but I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's I, don't know. I wasn't but, there. But uh, but I went for the history. So like I went over to the comedy store, which was the old Ciro's back in the 1940s. Yeah. And I didn't really care much about the comics who were on stage, which some were really funny, but some were a lot of people that they're not household names. But you know who are and were were the greats that were on the walls. And that, the wall, that, that's yeah. what I really looked up to. I have a that's another case where. I'm a tough crowd. People will say, let's go watch a night of stand up. And it's like. You know, and it isn't a snobbish stance because what strikes you as funny is a visceral reflexive thing. I don't work at not laughing, nor do I make myself laugh at things. I let myself laugh at it. And my taste in, in stand-up comedy is either really cerebral, like Stephen Wright or Woody Allen, or outrageous like Borat or Sam Kinison, uh, Gilbert Gottfried. I did three of his podcasts and we became friends and I miss him terribly. And just outrageous, fearless. Um, that can get me laughing so hard that I worry that my lungs won't reinflate before I faint. But unfortunately for me, speaking only for myself, the vast array of stand-up is at neither end of that spectrum. It's mostly in the middle. And that's what I would run into at comedy clubs. And I can't, <laughs> I can't fast forward yeah. and I can't focus on the beautiful cinematography and, and soundtrack. There's just a guy standing on a plank of wood at a microphone saying things and I'm, you know, wishing he would kind of hurry up even as I feel bad for him, unless everyone else is laughing, in which case it doesn't matter that I'm not. But, you know, I have offbeat tastes in certain things and it, 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 I tend to not want to go check out stand up places because of that. Maybe one during the night will really strike me funnily.
Yeah, I'm I'm I have a love hate relationship with stand up myself since I've been doing it for about 10 years now, but not enough where I'm going out on tour. It's kind of more just local emceeing, featuring and everything like that. And I I'm not in love with my material because I know what I like. And I, I was saying this on another podcast uh, talking about uh, about Shemp. Um, someone had a book that's uh, coming out. His name is Jeff Dale about Shemp. And I said that when I was a kid, I was not influenced by stand up comedy because we didn't have HBO. We didn't have Showtime growing up. And you had to be 18 or 21 to get into a comedy club in, in the 90s. No, you, had Alan King, you had Alan King on the Ed Sullivan show. Exactly. So, yeah, in between the Beatles uh, and whoever you would have, uh, Frank Gorshin would be doing impressions or, like you said, Alan King or going all the way back to the days of the Camel Caravan and uh, like more monologists of the day. But they were also they could also sing like Don Rickles would stop his show and start singing a song. Not that anybody wanted to hear a little bit <laughs> hear Don Rickles, but, uh, you know, he probably sings like hockey pucks or whatever. But he um, but it was a little bit more to it that he wasn't just an insult comic. Nowadays you have specific insult comics. You have insult, you have the, the right. roast battles they have nowadays. And that's where I'm at is when I was a kid, I was not raised on stand up. I was raised on Looney Tunes, three stooges. And of course the Marx brothers where my parents went to on their first date, which was a Marx brothers film festival back in uh, the early eighties. And uh, it so I've always had that in me and I've always been interested. So every time I see a, a TikTok trend or a, a hip new comedian that was on some MTV show and I'm like, yeah, you know what? Um, hmm. I, I guess I'm going to go back in time and watch those old Rodney Dangerfield on uh, Johnny Carson specials. That's that's where I'm at. I'm going yeah. backwards. But that is your prerogative, you know, and and it's like I don't care if people say. I need to, you know, modernize my taste or get with it or not be so, such an old fogey or something. It's like if, if that's what, I mean, I, I will still listen to classic rock more than most things. There are some more recent, you know, I like Sheryl Crow and, and uh, U2 and there, there's other people that come along since classic rock days. But I hate, loathe, and despise rap and hip hop uh, unless it's soundtrack for an inner city movie, in which case it works. But, and I don't think it's like a matter of my needing to acquire a taste for it. I just don't, you know, what, uh, one of my letters from Woody Allen, he says, people accuse me of, of just not getting it. I get it. I just don't like it. And I, exactly. I, feel, I feel similarly. It's like you don't need to explain it to me. I see what you're doing. And when you're dealing with something like laughter or music or art, painting, whatever, it, there's, there shouldn't be any kind of thinking and evaluating involved. It's just exposing yourself to this particular art form. And so if it makes you cry or scares you or makes you laugh, then that's cool. And if you find yourself looking at your watch or counting the holes in the ceiling or something like that, and it's not a deficiency on your part. It just doesn't. It's not your thing. Yeah, and I, and I love I, watching the interviews with Fred Astaire from the 70s, where he would say, like, um, I, I, I never analyzed dance. I would just try out a step and and... If it worked, sure. But analyzing dance, it's, it's not my bag. And it's like, <laughs> he, was, he was like 10 years away from anyone saying not my bag, but he felt he was being cool by phrasing. It's sort of like if he had said, it's just not groovy to do it now. But. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny because what you mentioned, I, I think a lot of it was the lack of variety. And it, it, as much as, they tried to bring the type of quote unquote variety show back with something like America's Got Talent, American Idol. Uh, you weren't getting the variety because as we mentioned about Ed Sullivan, you would have uh, you would have the Beatles that would be on. Then you would have uh, Martin and Rossi would be on after that. Uh, and, Alan, or Alan and Rossi. Rossi. Alan and Alan, Rossi. I was, yeah. yeah. 
I was saying Martin and Lewis, Maria, everything. So Alan, yeah, Marty Allen and uh, and uh, Steve Rossi, and then you would have Topo Gijo, and then a plate spinner, and then uh, and then, and then maybe Richard a dancer. Burton would come out and recite Shakespeare, They'd do something <laughs> like that. Yeah, they would have some some clowns uh, throwing each other all over the stage, and then Charles Lawton would come read uh, Dickens or something. <laughs> yeah, it really so, was so just a hodgepodge, but that was the. That was the charm of the show. It certainly wasn't Sullivan. Um, I think Fred Allen said of, of Ed Sullivan, you can teach a dog to point at actors. Because that's essentially what he did. He just sort of said, and now, still a mirror. And now, <laughs> Jose Greco. <laughs> I mean, it, it, but like if you were a fan of like one of the acts, you had to wait through the whole episode to see it. So you didn't realize again when we said were you, about having a film school, you didn't realize that you were actually getting cultured in other types of cultures that you may not have been interested in before. Nowadays, it's like, OK, well, I only want to watch stand up. So you have a not only a comedy central uh, to full on channel, but you have, hey, I just want to watch stand up comedy. I'll go on YouTube. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I like yeah. having that option to do that, but I think you're it also control, takes away. You're from in that. control of what you want to see. When I was growing up, it, it was in the hands of whatever movie Channel 5 was going to show, and I could either watch it or not. That was the choice, but I wasn't able to then, you know, pop in a Blu ray of something or. Ah, well, that's a it, it, well, uh, but if you if you do want to pop in a Blu-ray, hopefully someday pretty soon we you will see raised eyebrows. But in the meantime, go check it out and buy the book uh, ah. there. There it is. on. Look at that. I'm a, I, I know how to do <laughs> I've been doing this for radio for so long uh, of these segues. But uh, yes, raised eyebrows. You can get it on Amazon or go to Steve Stolier dot com and you can get an autograph copy. So yes. you personalize everything. And it's, if you're on uh, Amazon, you can also get the audio book, which I did. And and big surprise, I do all the voices uh, as I tell my story, because that's how I am anyway. Uh, if, you know, if someone has takes me out to lunch and says, what was it like when George Burns came to lunch? And I would say, well, I was nervous because I had such respect for him. And I opened the door and this little man looked up and said, Hi, you want to live a long time? Become an actor. You live to be an old man like Groucho and me. Okay, let's eat. <laughs> and I just do that, you know, among friends. So it was nothing for me to do it for the for the microphone as well. Well, this was most enjoyable. Yes, th thank you for doing this. Um, can you uh, can you indulge me in one quick story here before we go? It's the uh, when May West comes over. Uh, Groucho got a letter from Mae West that said she was remembering when they were both at Paramount laughing hysterically at the rushes of their movies. And boy, wouldn't we love to have the nanny cam of Mae West watching the rushes of like duck soup and laughing. <laughs> and she ended with, of all things, come up and see me sometime of course so but instead groucho invited her to visit him and i was lucky enough to be there that night and now groucho understandably was not awed or intimidated at the thought of meeting a famous performer because he was had been one himself for so many years Aaron Fleming, the previously mentioned ambitious crazy woman that ran the house, she was very nervous about everything being just right and having fresh cut flowers and the house cleaned up. She really wanted to make this impression on Mae West and just have it go flawlessly. And she said to Groucho, be on your best behavior which is similar to putting a wet paint do not touch sign on a fence and then walking away as a bunch of young kids are coming by. 
Um, <laughs> and his answer was something like, I'm always on my best behavior. What are you talking about? <laughs> so so uh, two of the two of the uh, parts of May's legacy, one of them was that when she and W.C. Fields were making My Little Chickadee, I think because each had an ego the size of a Macy's balloon, um, they did not get along well. There was great competition, who gets the, the, the last laugh in this scene, all that. And they sort of ended up hating each other. And if they had something to say to each other, would have to pass a note with an intermediary who would bring it over from Mr. Field to Miss West and, and vice versa. So that was one thing was that Mae West hated W.C. Fields. The other was that in the 20s, uh, she was appearing in a play she had written called Sex and was arrested for indecency and had to spend the night in the jail uh, for which she got a lot of publicity, which may have been what she was hoping for to begin with, but she did have, she was jailed. So, so Mae West comes over with her bodybuilder assistant the first thing Groucho says is, hey, May, what do you hear from Bill Fields? <laughs> and Aaron is like mortified. <laughs> and May West said, in your dreams, Groucho, in your dreams. And then not long after that, he said, say, didn't they throw you in the pokey once? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, they did, but I always managed to wriggle out of tight situations like that. And she wiggled her hips. You know, this is a woman in her late 80s. So she was short. body all the way to the end. Yes, that was her, you know, that was her persona. It's like maybe Van Doren now still posting nude pictures of herself in her night. I, I'm shocked. I, I follow her on Facebook. I'm like, yeah. wait a second here. What's yes. what is going on? Here? Yes. Well, yes. Uh, but then it was just a magical evening. Um, uh, Aaron wanted to know if she could sing, and she and she had said, I, "I didn't bring any of my records with the background music." But Harpo's son Bill, who was a and is a successful musician and composer in his own right, was on hand at the piano, and she said, "Well, if you like, I can do some reciting." And so. She went over to the piano and steadied herself with one hand on the piano. And then Bill started playing a honky-tonk version of Frankie and Johnny. And then she started reciting this body poem about, uh, it was called Pleasure Man, and uh, all about the... the all the different women this guy had and, and losing them and finding someone. And it's like, I'm, I'm looking at this tableau and here's the king and queen of early Paramount comedy. And here is Mae West reciting from by heart this body poem that she had written in the 20s while Harpo's son is playing ding, 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 ding. And it was really just a remarkable. And uh, I had a book of hers that I asked her to sign, and she wrote to Steve, sin hyphen Searly. She always separated the sin from the Searly. So, yes, she Incredible. kept up the persona to the end. She was, you know, the embodiment of sex appeal, even though she was an octogenarian who never went out while the sun was up and she had just alabaster white skin. Wow, it's, it, it's amazing. I, I, heard, I heard, a, I heard, a, I, I won't, I, I won't tell it on here because it's, it's, it's rude, but apparently there was a story with her and, and Steve Rossi. <laughs> Have you heard about this one? No, is it anything it, like uh, Lenny Bruce's grave? Uh, something is something along the lines. Uh, I know Jackie Martling, which you, you know, if if there's anybody to trust, it's a Jackie Martling story about something along the lines of Steve and May West had a had a little <laughs> little hookup in a dressing room, shall we say? And uh, again, this is Jackie saying this that uh, 
she uh, happened to be uh, down on a certain area of his and uh, he put his hand on her head and her wig fell off. <laughs> and as Jackie says, Steve Rossi says, well, I guess the, I guess I'm in showbiz now. Uh, I don't know if that's I'll, true, but that's, I know uh, uh, here's here's the part that I know would be true. May West maintained that all of the hair on top of her head was hers. Um, that may be true in the sense that she paid good money for it, and so she <laughs> took possession of it. But she and Groucho were at a, it was a salute to 20th Century Fox. There was some big dinner with all these stars, and there were a couple of pictures taken of her with Groucho there. And she mentioned about her hair, you know, she was getting all these compliments on her hair, and Groucho had kind of put his hands on her shoulders for the photo. There it is on the left. And when he, is, yeah, his, when he lifted his hands to put them back next to his sides, the top chunk of her coiled hair came off in his hands and had to be reattached. I don't think... It's very strange for me to look at that photo and think I met both of them. <laughs> um, I don't know that he did it to embarrass her. I think it was uh, just a, an accident of brushing past the top of her hair. And I guess it wasn't, she didn't use enough bobby pins or whatever. So although it is not sexual in nature, it is at least a second story about may west's hair coming apart <laughs> yeah it doesn't confirm anything but doesn't deny certain aspects either yes, but uh, i shall neither confirm nor deny so it but if you want to look at more pictures of groucho again they are in raised eyebrows go check it out from steve stolier steve that thanks again for doing this i love talking to you not just about because like I, I know a lot of people have booked you on shows and just talked about so you worked with groucho and everything but not only have I talked to you before, I want people to read this in the book because that's why I, I didn't even talk about Aaron Fleming in the podcast yeah. because it's it's almost unbelievable that what you went through and what Groucho went through with Aaron that you have to read it because you have to read it again. You go, wait, wait, wait a second. Wait, wait, let me go back and flipping pages and going, did she really do this? Is this something that, that truly happened here? Yeah. So I want I encourage people to go check out the book and you will really get a you know, a real glimpse into what happened in those final years with Groucho. And that a little bit after going through that uh, conservatorship and, uh, and, uh, but and, as, but as I say it in the, I mean, in the book, I draw the analogy to wizard of Oz where opening the front door on my first day of work was like Dorothy opening the door into Oz and going from sepia to technicolor. And the Oz analogy holds true for the end because even though there was, I was watching my hero slowly fade out and putting up with a very difficult mercurial person, just as Dorothy says something along the lines of, some of it wasn't very nice, but most of it was beautiful. That's how I, I look back. It was still so overwhelmingly positive and life-changing, but I didn't pull any punches on the darker stuff and likewise, the film is not going to be a comedy per se. It's going to be a drama with humor and with laughs. But, you know, this is that story and it's not sugarcoated, uh, nor is it exploitative. So we shall see. Anyway, well, it, thanks for having me on, Anthony. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, no, it's uh, talking about a lot of with your career and who you met and everything is also a, a part of it, because it's not just I'm booking Steve Stolier of Groucho Marx fame. It's Steve Stolier, who's basically done a lot in uh, in Hollywood the last, uh, you know, since the since the 70s and uh, all the way from from being that kid at UCLA and somehow getting Groucho over and trying to get Animal Crackers released to not eventually just a working kid at UCLA, him. but. When our family moved from St. Louis to California, and I, it's like I had seen, I was only seven years old, and I had seen 
I Love Lucy and the Lucy Desi Comedy Hour, where wherever Lucy turned, she'd run into Bob Hope or John Wayne or you know Harpo. George Reeves. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so we're on this airplane going from St. Louis to L.A., and directly in front of us was Red Skelton, and then several seats ahead of him was Andy Griffith. And I thought, it really is like I Love Lucy. We haven't even landed in Los Angeles yet, and there's two TV stars here. And Skelton was wonderful. He kept us entertained during the flight. And uh, so, yeah, I've been fascinated with celebrities. And, you know, going to movies was a big deal for my mom when she was growing up. And so when we moved to L.A., she was forever slowing down the car and saying, is that someone? Meaning, is that someone who has been on our television set or in a movie theater? And she was always jazzed at the idea of seeing someone she had seen on television. I'm sorry she didn't live long enough to see me get the Groucho gig because she would have really appreciated that. But life is not always fair, as you may have figured out. Yeah, I've uh, I've had a bit of experience with that as well. But hey, you know what? Uh, it's look, life may not be fair, but what was fair is that uh, I got an email back from Steve Stolier says, "Yeah, I'd love to do the podcast." So I'm mm-hmm. grateful to have you on, and it's uh, it's it, it's been a pleasure speaking to you for for this time, and uh, and, and thanks a lot. I really do sure. really do appreciate this. My pleasure. Take care. And I'd say good luck with the book, but the book's been out for so many years, but I guess continued success with the book and then eventually okay. the uh, the movie coming out. Thank you ever so. And thank you folks for listening to the Check Your Brain podcast or watching it on the YouTube page. And if you like more, I've got another episode coming out next week, next Wednesday. So if you enjoyed this, hit the subscribe button, give me a five-star like, or don't, doesn't matter to me. <laughs> so take it easy, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye.